And welcome into the round table. And we've talked a lot about the Panama Canal as of recent history in terms of what's going on there with the drought and not as many ships needing to go through or can go through those interchanges there as well. And now sh the, the attention of the world, the shipping world shifts to Yemen and the Suez Canal and what problems that situation is bringing on as well. Joining us to talk about it, we've got Sal Mercagliano, of course, host of What's Going On With Shipping, as well as Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, and our own senior writer, Greg Miller, joining us as well. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Sal, we've been talking about the Panama Canal, and now all of a sudden, Yemen has decided to, to kind of choke up that particular point as an access to the Suez Canal from the south. What kind of difficulty is this causing right now in terms of basically causing people to have, or causing shippers to have to go around Africa if they want to avoid possibly uh, seeing hostilities there? Well, Bill, thanks for having me on. Uh, I think, number one, the only diversions we're seeing right now are ships related to Israel-owned or connections to it. So we're not seeing the huge diversions yet. What we're seeing is a little bit of an uptick in insurance costs going from about 0.03% up to maybe 0.05, 0.1%. So you're talking about an increase of several you know, tens of thousands of dollars to transit through the area. Uh, the potential here is that the Houthis don't have very good intelligence in what ships to hit and connecting them back to the Israelis. And, you know, when they grabbed the Galaxy Leader and they hit the Central Park, they had some connections to that. But the attack on the ship like the number nine demonstrates that their intelligence is dated or they're not using very good sources. And that has the potential now to escalate. And the fact that the Houthi have made a statement that they're going to interdict or blockade or stop the passage of any ships heading to Israel means that this could expand out to uh, include other flags and other registries out there. So I, I think right now where we're at is seeing is this a real danger? Do shippers really begin to make that long shift around Africa to get around? Because if that's the case, what you're going to see is longer ship voyages. You're going to lose uh, roundabout voyages or round trip voyages for ships, which means they either have to increase capacity on the vessels or increase the number of vessels on the voyages. Greg, what are you, what are you seeing and hearing in terms of what is, could possibly be going on here with the Suez Canal in terms of it not being an, uh, an alternative? Again, in the situation, the fact that we're looking at right now currently uh, Israeli flagged or Israeli related ships, but something that obviously, as Sal mentioned, could expand further. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Uh it's not that easy to know which ships are connected to Israel. You have a couple big ship owners in Israel, um, uh, Eastern Pacific and Zodiac and a number of others. But you know, even I as a journalist, when I'm trying to figure out you know, which ship is connected to which owner, I mean, that's actually, that's actually quite difficult. Uh, you know, shipping fre frequently obfuscates uh, you know, what the connections are. I mean, if you think about uh, the shipping line Zim, they don't even publish their own fleet list. Um, you know, they, they don't tell journalists or anyone, they don't tell investors, you know, what the ships are in their fleet. You actually have to look at the schedules and, and try to figure out for yourself. So the, um, you know, the, the possibility uh, of, of ships that are going to be mistakenly targeted uh, is very high, I think. Uh, and, you know, the big question here is really uh, escalation. You know, what happens? It's very easy to see, you know, the possibility that, uh, you know, one of these drones, for example, hits a, you know, a, a container with flammable material or otherwise starts a fire on a vessel or somehow hits a, a, a Navy ship. And then, you know, it becomes much more difficult for the U.S. and, and the allies to continue to not retaliate, which is pretty clear they have the intention of they're trying to stick to not escalating this into something that's much more serious. But sooner or later, something could happen and that becomes a much more significant issue for shipping. So how much is it, it does it complicate matters at all if if you've got ships that aren't necessarily maybe maybe connected to Israel maybe not but just maybe stopping in Israel in terms of I mean I'm sure that's what the the Yemen are, are try, Yemenis are trying to to do in terms of I mean that's that's basically their battleground uh, so to speak um, but if a ship's making more than one stop and just maybe part of the cargo is headed there does that make them a target does that make things more complicated given how many stops these ships make. 
Yeah, I mean, it's going to be really hard for Yemen to identify. I think Greg makes an excellent point. You know, when we have to sit there and research a vessel, it's really hard to find ownership and, and schedules are always changing. And so when Yemen makes a blanket statement like this, and let's be clear, you know, Yemen's in the middle of a civil war. So we're dealing with the Houthi here. It's not even the recognized government of right. Yemen. Uh, you can't really shut down this passage under UNCLOS. You have free transit through the area. Uh, this is what's going to start triggering a lot of nations to get involved. You already have an NYK vessel, the, the Galaxy Leader that's being held. And so, you know, it, it's going to be hard for them to identify. I think this is the big variable we keep coming back to is that there's a potential here for ships to be hit that have nothing to do with this at all, which means you're impinging the, the free trade of basically neutral ships uh, heading through the area. And that will trigger a, a response. While the US Navy and other navies may not be willing to go in there or say publicly that they're gonna go in and defend Israel, uh, they will come in and sit there and say, you're impinging on free transit. And under UNCLOS, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, Yemen cannot close the Straits uh, or the Bab el Mandab for vessels to come in. And we're already seeing deployment of ships from Japan, for example, which are heading that way. The Chinese have a squadron stationed right there in Djibouti. And so, you know, if the Yemen starts to hit vessels that have connection to other nations, then it's not just the United States, but other states can get involved. It's going to be very, very interesting to watch, uh, and hopefully uh, things don't escalate too much there as well. But that, that being said, uh, Greg, as you look at the situation, um, you, know, we, we, you did an article late last week about um, the fact that, or this is an interview where, where someone said uh, that if there's a black swan event, we'll see rates rise dramatically again. Is this the kind of thing that could possibly be that? If we see escalation here, if we see more ships uh, do that long diversion around the uh, the Horn of Africa. Well, I mean that was that was described as a as an outlier event. I mean, the, you know, the consensus uh, certainly amongst the, the carriers and pretty much everyone is that, uh, you know, freight rates in the container shipping business next year are going to be very low and probably the year after that. But, you know, the the, 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 the situation here is you've got this drought in the Panama Canal and mm -hmm. There's, you, know, you have these uh, restrictions that are that are escalating. You know, at starting January first, the Neo Panamax locks will locks will be at half the capacity they were a couple months ago, and so you have the two two of the the big three uh, ocean alliances have preemptively decided. Uh, to switch uh, uh, their Asia East Coast services over to the Suez. So the Suez suddenly, because of Panama, becomes much more important. Now, it normally takes about, uh, say, a month to get from, from Shanghai to New York. Uh, if you put that through the Suez, you add another week or 25 percent more time. If you go through, uh, if you have to go around the Cape of Good, Good Hope, you're adding another 10 days. So you're adding about 50 percent of the transit distance to all of these services, we're not even talking about Asia, uh, Europe services, and so when you when you inc increase uh, the distance, you increase the number of ships you have to put in those strings, and when you do that, yes, uh, there's all this new capacity coming online next year. I think it's about ten percent or so for next year alone. Uh, uh, so there is a scenario where uh, more and more ships are going to be required for these longer voyages, and at the same time. A lot of the charter tonnage is going to go off lease. And so the carriers, there's a scenario here where it's not going to be uh, as as cheap as you think it will be next year. But again, that's an outlier scenario. There's a lot of hypotheticals there. Yeah, definitely. So certain things we got to, certain bridges we have to cross to get that, uh, to see that situation resolve itself uh, to that level. Sal, uh, going to, to Greg's point about looking at the two canals, again, how does one affect the other necessarily? And certainly, you know, say, for instance, in American exports, if you're caught between the two and you've got to go either around South America or around Africa, that's a long way to haul there a as well. What do you look at when you look at the, the, the fact that both canals right now are, are some difficulty if you want to make the, the, take the chance of going through either one of them? Yeah, I mean, you come back to the issue back when we had the supply chain crisis in 2020 and starting on, that was a global event. It impacted shipping worldwide. And usually shipping can handle one black swan event. It can suck it up and, and accommodate it. The problem with the canals are when you start having issues with the maritime choke points, then you're funneling traffic through key areas. And that is the potential for that happening. You know, the Suez Canal has a capacity too. I mean, they can only handle up to about 90 ships a day going through it. And so if you start shifting a lot of traffic into the Suez Canal, we're going to hit the point of 
problems with that. We also have rates about to increase on the Suez Canal. Suez Canal is much more expensive than the Panama Canal to go through. And so you're weighing the cost to go through it. But I think Greg's point is the big one is the added time. Time is the issue here. Because if you have a ship that can make maybe four or five runs a year from Europe to Asia, uh, and all of a sudden you have to go around Africa, well, now you're going to be cutting one of those routes out. And that means a massive loss of revenue, which means it's got to translate into the higher freight rates to kind of offset that. And so what we're looking at here is the potential for events all kind of happening at the same time. If you throw in there issues in the South China Sea with the Chinese and the Philippines having issues, we have a potential in northern South America right now for Venezuela, Colombia, Chile, and Brazil for maybe a struggle over Guyana. This becomes a, a much bigger issue where global shipping can see disruptions. I don't think you see the stop flow of goods at all, but once you have disruptions, once you create those abnormal flow patterns, then all of a sudden your rates start going up and that's what impacts the cost for consumers. Greg, when, if you're a shipper right now and you're looking at all these variables that Sal just kind of outlined there, what are you most concerned about, again, given the route, obviously you're going to be going different places, but uh, what are you most concerned about right now in the world of shipping in terms of getting your goods from point A to point B? Well, I mean, it's different by sector. Uh, you know, when it comes to this, the combination of these two canals, uh, you know, the, the good thing for container shipping uh, shippers is that there are so many new ships coming online. So there is the flexibility to extend these voyages. Uh, it's much more prob bad, problematic in dry bulk for U.S. grain exports. Uh, uh, it's much more problematic for LPG propane exports. As far as container shippers next year, again, you know, the consensus is that Rates probably aren't going to go up that much. That's a consensus. What people are really concerned about next year is disruptions. You have these extended uh, voyages. You have to prepare for the fact that it may take much longer for your car to get there. And if the cons consensus is true and rates are low for next year and the year after, then what that means is that the container lines are going to accelerate their blank sailings and their cancellations. And so you're going to get uh, more disruptions to the services. So really, you know, the consensus seems to be for next year that it's not so much a fear at this point on the container side of a huge rate increase. Really, the concern is that, uh, you know, you're going to have to worry about goods not you know, taking a lot longer to get there and you're going to have to worry about more canceled sailings. Well, to uh, quote Sal's YouTube channel, what's going on with shipping? The answer to that question seems to be a lot right now. So, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, that'll do it for a round table. We'll take a short break and be back with more for content. Wrap up the show right after this.